This is Tommy's Outdoors 114. And before I introduce this episode of the podcast, just a quick reminder that now you can rate the podcast on Spotify. Spotify rolled out this option to rate the podcast. So if you're listening on Spotify, go in there right now. Like there's no reason to not do it right now and leave the five star rating. And um, if you're listening on Apple, you always could rate the podcast on Apple. So five star rating is always appreciated. And on Apple, you can also go an extra mile and leave the review. Review is always great. So uh, rate the podcast. And now, folks, uh, today I'm bringing you my conversation with Steve Cracknell. Steve Steve is an author of uh, the book, The Implausible Rewilding of the Pyrenees. And those of you who follow me on social media, at Outdoors Podcast on Twitter, or Tommy's Outdoors on Instagram and Facebook, uh, may already notice that I wrote a blog about it. And uh, in that blog, I said that this is uh, one of the best books uh, that I read uh, when it comes to content. And this is the the best book, um, at least in a decade, in terms of how it is put together. And uh, uh, those of you who are watching me on uh, on, uh, on YouTube right now, uh, there, there it is, there's the book. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, show that on camera, but it is heavy in, in hands. It is a, has a, like a high quality, beautiful chalk paper. Uh, the typesetting is absolutely top notch. It, it's uh, the pictures like, look at that, look at that uh, pictures. Uh, the, it, it's like a, like a um, little album, really. Um, so it is uh, more expensive than your average book on Amazon, uh, but it is worth every penny. And you can buy this book using uh, one of the provided links, either on the blog or in the description of this show. And if you buy the book using one of those links, I will get a small commission. That doesn't affect your price, but you can support the podcast by buying that book. And uh, those small commissions are, you know, uh, are great help for me in running the podcast. Um, and and speaking about buying stuff on Amazon, you can if you get to Amazon through one of those links, you can actually buy anything you wanted and I will still get a small commission. So if you're doing your shopping on Amazon, go in there. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but you will support the podcast that way. Um, folks, so this book is not like rewilding is all good. There's actually substantial conflict in there uh, in relation to bears. And Steve is giving us his firsthand experiences. He interviews proponents of bears and opponents of bears and, uh, you know, uh, does substantial amount of research. And uh, it is really balanced and nuanced book. It's, it's, that's what I was saying. This is one of the greatest books uh, I, ever, uh, I ever read. Um, so if you're uh, still not convinced that you should buy this book, then listen to this podcast. And I am sure that uh, by the end of the podcast, you will just go in there and buy the book using one of the provided links below. Um, uh, other than that, you may notice, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, that I'm wearing a very outdoorsy forest green t-shirt with Tommy's Outdoors logo. Uh, so you can go to tommysoutdoors.com t-shirts and buy one of those t-shirts. Um, they are selling out pretty quickly, so I hope you will get the uh, size you want. And um, yeah, finally, oh, obviously, um, you can go to tommysoutdoors.com books and you can buy there not only Steve's book, but also other books, uh, nature-related, uh, nature-themed books that I recommend. Again, uh, links are provided. Uh, you know what to do. And uh, finally, before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, if you want to do for something for me personally, now you can buy me a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com slash Tommy's Outdoors. The link is in the description of the show. Uh, I need a caffeine. That's very appreciated because I'm editing those episodes either extremely early in the morning or late, or late at night because I obviously I have a day job. Uh, so this is how I'm rolling. Uh, so if you support me that way by buying a coffee, that will be greatly appreciated. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, Steve Cracknell and the implausible rewilding of the Pyrenees.
Steve, welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's nice to be here. I, I must admit, this is the, 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 the book uh, we're going to talk about today is one of the best books ever for me, starting from you know how it's put together and the, the content. Oh boy, it doesn't disappoint. It's it's just we, we're gonna dive deeper in, into this pot in this podcast. Now tell me before we like what was the what was your motivation to write this book and what was your motivation to, to on the on the choice of the topic? Um I'd long been interested in the Pyrenees. I've been walking through the Pyrenees for the last twenty five years since my wife and I moved to France. And the one question which kept coming up was about the reintroduction of bears or the reinforcement of the population, if you want to put it like that. And the question which I would never managed quite to sort out in my mind was, um, are bears and sheep compatible? And so I read a lot on, on the subject And when I was looking for a subject for a new book on the Pyrenees principally, uh, rather than a book on conservation or ecology or something, uh, this was something which was always in my mind. I thought it might be quite stressful having the different views thrown at me, but I wanted to talk to people who were as close to the problem the possibilities as possible. So I didn't, books and newspapers are too far distant. And since I was frequently in the mountains themselves, I had that opportunity to meet shepherds and to meet ecologists uh, and hunters who live there and can give me first-hand accounts. And it developed from that as a kind of, witness statements rather than trying to put over my view. I, what I've tried to do, and I don't really know whether I have succeeded, is to reproduce what those people said. I, obviously, you are biased. You can't avoid that. And that's why I've got, it's not just a series of interviews. It's also, you learn something about me as well. So you can place my choice of, um, interviewees and my choice of what I wrote down in context. You know, this is one of the things that I always really appreciate in, in, in any material, whether it's a book or blog or podcast or, or whatever else, presenting different views because all these issues, especially around the conservation and the rewilding are so complex and uh, there's no one answer. It, 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 it resonated with me completely uh, on all levels how long it took you to to actually you know from start to finish including research because there's like enormous amount of research went into the book as well you have a references to to scientific papers and all that so how long it, it like start to finish well apart from the fact that i've been following the uh story for the last 25 years uh since the first reintroductions in 1996 Uh, I really seriously got interested after there was a big um, attack. In fact, it was just one bear, but it managed to panic the sheep. 209 of them died by trying to escape, running down a slope that was just too steep for them. And following that, there was a big outcry. And in that December, the first meeting, the first big meeting of shepherds to protest about that situation. At that stage, I wasn't quite sure where I was going, but I went to that meeting, um, made lots of contacts, and that gave me the, the springboard for uh, seeing those shepherds in their mountain pastures. That Was that the meeting in a, in a book when the, when the riot squad was, uh, was on? No, that's, that was the later, a later meeting. That was about six, six months afterwards. The first meeting was very uh, much uh, more sober. In, it was in a university annex in Foix. Oh, okay. And um, there were various speakers. There was the prefect, who is the local government official, uh, who was speaking. There was uh, 
um, a lawyer. There was the head of the department, which is the French administrative district and so on. And that started out quite um, dispassionately, but got more and more uh, passionate as the as the time went on. <laughs> I think he 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 heated up. Um, how did, how 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 were you selecting the guests? What was the what was the the thought process? Did you you know try to you know was it like you know I have like three people from this side, three people from this side, or or was it like what, how how did you go about? Did you have like a li predetermined list who you want to talk about, or did you like go uh, you know? As as you were going deeper and deeper, you were figuring this out. It was uh, partly chance, partly from people that I already knew and making further contacts. At that meeting uh, in Foix, there was a woman called Giselle Guazé. Uh, she invited me to come to her her farm, and although she appears very little in the book, uh, she was a contact, and I went to see her shepherd. Maxime Kane uh, up in the summer pastures. And from there, uh, I knew already that things were happening in a different way. On the other side of the frontier, I had some friends who were going walking there. I went to see them and got in contact with another shepherd on the other side of the same mountain to see what difference that makes. Uh, and some of the people... I was staying in a, a walker's hostel and somebody mentioned that this particular shepherd, Jérôme Brunet, uh, was an interesting person to talk to. I knew nothing about him apart from the fact that he was an interesting person to talk to. So I, uh, I rang him up. I didn't know what his position on bears might be, but I found him fascinating as a person to interview. Then I went, there was an event which was the arrival of two bears um, in 2018 from Slovenia. And this was all over the local and indeed national papers and television news and so on. So I went there to be part, to find out what was going on. And instead of meeting, as I thought I would do, protesters, what I met was um, uh, a group of farmers who actually thought that the bears had a right to be there. So I've seen, I've talked in terms of shepherds and sheep farmers, the whole range of opinions. Hmm. Uh, it then broadened because of what some of the interviewees said and uh, other people that I met. And so I went to, the, uh, to Abruzzo in Italy to look at the situation there, to make a comparison. I also talked to uh, a shepherd in the Massif Centrale and another one from the French Alps mm -hmm. to see, particularly in their cases, the last two cases, uh, how they were dealing with wolves. Because there are a few wolves, there are perhaps 20 wolves in the Pyrenees, but they haven't really reached here and not having any great impact. Whereas in the Pyrenees, the big impact is the bears. Uh, it is, this is, you know, even interesting from that standpoint that usually um, when you talk about wolves and bears, that's that's wolves that uh, produce more conflict and bears are surprisingly, you know, less less controversial, I guess, in general. But 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 Pyrenees in the situation that you're describing in your book is, is special in that front, but probably because there is not um, that many bear that many wolves in there. Um, Steve, so. When you were scheduling and when you were, you know, contacting those people, all those d different groups, did you have an, um, any feeling like one of those groups? I mean, because you 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 openly uh, saying in a in a book that generally we have shepherds, we have hunters, and we have environmentalists, right? Or call them farmers and the rewilders, and in general, they are on kind of different side of the fence. Although, like you mentioned, there are shepherds who think like yeah bear is is here <laughs> you know I, I i think there was a statement in the book that one lady said like even grandpa says that the bears are part of pyrenees right it was like very um very telling but overall uh, uh, in those groups did one of them did you felt like one of them were more reluctant 
talking with you because I, I'm just wondering like how how much you got this kind of um, pushback almost like oh what is this, is this guy up to? It was more difficult to talk to some shepherds. Some shepherds uh, really didn't want me to talk to them, uh, partly because it's uh, a it's an, uh, a story which has been going on for twenty five years and. The, even though they may be thoroughly against bats or indeed for them, they were bored with the whole thing and wanted to move on. Uh, in terms of media contact, they still wanted their point of view to predominate. Uh, they wanted either fewer bats, no bats, more government help, and so on. But um, So there were one or two shepherds that I didn't manage to get hold of. Uh, I didn't try that hard to get hold of environmentalists because uh, for the audience I expect for the book, they would probably already be well aware of the environmental point of view. And the two people that I really talked to on that aspect uh, who are ecologists, um, and, and were Alan Wren and Gérard Cousimon. And they said all, and uh, indeed Patrick uh, Levisou, they said all that really needed to be said, uh, whereas the, the shepherds were a more diverse group and needed. What, what I, one of the things I realized, and I didn't realize before, is quite how different shepherds can be, how different their farms are, how different their sheep are, and the way they manage their sheep. So it's it's really all about nuance. It may be that in some areas, bears and sheep are compatible, but they won't, certainly won't be everywhere. What happens to those shepherds who are in those areas where the management is going to be impossible? I got this. Uh, I, I got this uh, feeling from your book as well that the. Uh, in environmentalist side, there's there are no environmentalists who are against bear. That's that's sorted. <laughs> While on the side of of both shepherds and probably hunters, uh, there is a varied uh, views and varied opinions. Um, what was the most memorable interview? Like the one that really stuck out with you? It was um, Jérôme Brunet because he didn't need to be there. He it's a shepherd that actually lives quite near to where I live. Uh, I didn't know him before the interview. Um, and he was the one who said, I was told, had interesting opinions. He had a flock of sheep for 20 years already down in the lowlands. And he wanted a new summer pasture. So he could have chosen a different place, but he thought, I'll see what it's like in the area where there are bears. And it must have had other advantages, uh, advantages as well as potential disadvantages. Is it possible to uh, live with bears? Is, it, I will, is, is um, bringing up sheep compatible with that? And he took on what, in the end, uh, uh, was seen to be a, a rather difficult pasture uh, in terms of the topography and so on. He thought to himself, well, you know, it's the first year here. Uh, I can't expect to do very well the first year. Uh, he lost about 10 sheep. To bears. To bears, which you might say it's a small proportion out of the 400 that he had in his care. Uh then the, but the second year was no better. And he thought, you know, however long I am here, I'm going to be in the same situation. It wasn't so much the numbers, uh, because there is compensation, but as a shepherd, you're trying to protect your sheep. You're trying to give them the best life possible, knowing that they're going to be eaten in the end. But while they're there, you want them to have a, a a good time, if you like. Yeah. And um, there was that, and it's always a stressful for the shepherd. Every night, he is saying, I was um, tense 
worrying about whether I would have to get up in the middle of the night to chase off a bear with a light. It doesn't have guns or anything like that. You're not allowed to have guns. So and one night he he got up and there was, in fact, he said in August there were two nights out of three, there were bears roaming around his flock despite him having all the protective measures in place, which are the uh, guard dogs bringing their sheep in at night and being there permanently. He was still finding the bears were testing him out. And so after two years there, he decided that it was just too stressful and went back to it. He found himself a different summer pasture. So he was somebody, I think, who was very open about the possibilities of uh, um, living with bears and, fa- and didn't manage to do it. It doesn't mean to say that other people wouldn't manage better or would be less concerned about the loss of some of their sheep because it's not just bears that um, cause sheep to die in the uh, Pyrenees. Sheep are, can be pretty stupid. If you know, there's a kind of saying in farming circles that if it's, a sheep can find a way to kill itself, it will do so. And there's some bizarre stories um, about the stupid things that sheep have done. And it's also true that many sheep just die of old age or ordinary accidents. So mm-hmm. that. The proportion to be expected of sheep dying in the Pyrenees is 5% without bears. And bears don't, in general, add a huge percentage to that, except in the area where Jérôme was, in the Ariège, and where there is the biggest problems with bears, which is also the Ariège, and the biggest pushback, of course. Yeah. So that was Jérôme who was the most interesting from that point of view. Um, but it's not just a question of bears and sheep. I want to emphasize that. What it is is um, two world views, and which is why the book is of more interest than just uh, looking at bears and sheep in the Pyrenees. There are two groups of people who are more or less in opposition in their way, they, their values, and the way they look at nature. Uh, and it's that that carries over elsewhere that is as relevant in Britain, in Ireland, in the United States. So what I was really looking at, I think, is not the question of bears and sheep, but the question of uh, values amongst people and the question coming down to uh, who owns the land, Yes, this is always the, the, the these conversations always go into first these groups and uh, worldview and then down to land ownership. And and you're right, the conversation conversations that you're presenting in a book and even that conversation that we have here are as relevant and they're all, almost one to one to what happened or potentially what could happen in. UK or Ireland, but also in other countries in, in, in Europe, like in Germany or, or Poland, where it's essentially the same. Just to be clear about owns the land, I, owns the land. I mean uh, not people who are necessarily the uh, real owners, but people who have used it for so long, or even people who live in towns uh, have no ownership of land in the countryside, but still have a link mentally or otherwise with that land and wish to, that it is managed in certain ways. So it's nobody owns anything 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you did you manage, like, did you have any technique to kind of um, get their trust of your, like people who initially didn't want to talk to you? Um, did you, did, were you trying to convince them that, look, I'm trying to be, you know, as, uh, um, you, you know, I'm not trying to not take sides and, and trying to be, you know, or did where your approach was like, no, if, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, forcing or convincing anyone if they don't want to talk to me. Um, 
I think what one of the best things I did was to go to that meeting in Flab, and I met there Philippe Lacoub, who is one of the most known anti-bear activists. And he's a nice guy in uh, many ways, and he's very intelligent. Um, and I went to interview him for virtually the first person I saw, and this gave me an entry into all kinds of other shepherds' uh, circles. And I talked to Alan Wren, who is more or less the mirror image, uh, which gave me an entry into environmental circles. I know um, a few hunters, so because hunting is quite big in the south of France and in the Pyrenees, so that was that was easy to fix. Uh, you, you know, I had a... I don't know why I had a feeling like you me you mentioned uh throughout the book these three groups like we like we said farmers or or shepherds and hunters and then the environmentalists but I feel like hunters were maybe underrepresented I don't know with I it didn't it stuck with me like I like this guy who is a hunter 100% and he he's his view was that was that on purpose or whether there's a significant overlap between hunters and shepherds because you know I, i'm asking because i didn't i i didn't really uh came out with the somehow clear view like what is the predominant uh attitude of of hunters let's say to to bears are they predominantly for bears or they're predominantly against bears because like you know they make, can make arguments both ways like shepherds currently i would say that hunters are aligning themselves with shepherds as being against bears. There is no prospect of, in the short term, bears being hunted. But hunters aren't just a group that wants to kill animals. It's much more subtle than that. Um, because the hunters were in, hunters undoubtedly uh, put paid to the last Pyrenean ibex oh, and by overhunting in the 19th century such that the remaining ibex were genetically impoverished and eventually uh, other pressures, including hunting, but also uh, habitat loss, meant that the uh, local subspecies died out. But then the hunters have been uh, instrumental in bringing back ibex. Another very curious, I think, and quite amusing uh, story of hunters is that the first, virtually the first in mammal introduction in the Pyrenees was marmots. Huh. And they were brought in by two hunters who thought it more or less it would be a bit of fun. Nobody hunts marmots. Nobody eats marmots unless you're desperate in the 19th century, you might have done so. But then, uh, so they found another hunter, naturalist, who helped them, and they brought six marmots back into the Pyrenees, released them in 1948, and there were further reintroductions, and now there are 10,000. In fact, it's a, I call it a reintroduction, but to be fair, uh, the last marmots were seen 11,000 years ago in the Pyrenees. Oh, okay. So it's not something that disappeared in recent times. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Are, are there any pushback against marmots? Are people are no, no. Everybody likes marmots. Okay, I'm, I'm asking because uh, marmots are a, a, a little bit like groundhog in the in the US. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I I spoken with uh, a farmer and from the US, and they're like, oh, groundhogs. They're menace. They're like they they hate them. Uh, so that's why I was, I was wondering: is it like specific to something specific to groundhogs or or US? Is in are there any people who are complaining about marmots that they're chewing up on their you know? Well, you, they dig up um, pastures, but really the percentage in the area they dig up is so minimal. Um, even and I say there are ten thousand in the Pyrenees. Ten thousand. The Pyrenees is four hundred kilometers long from. Don't one in from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. During your interviews, did you ever had situation where you're listening to a person and you go like, "Well, 
this is so wrong and so you know I cannot put that in the book and did you did you ever had any any situation like this like oh man I lost my time um, because I, I would imagine then you know you you were you were talking with people who were have a quite extreme views at the at the point so where your attitude is like yeah I'm put that I'm gonna put everything to the letter into the book or was it like no I just it's too much. Well, the interviews usually lasted an hour, an hour and a half, and there might be some informal talking before and afterwards and so on, uh, of which only about 10 minutes worth I would ever get into the book. So there is certainly uh, a selection process. And the way I did it wasn't so much trying to say, oh, this I can't put in. And there are some things that uh, I immediately say, you know, this is clearly not true, not very many, because I prefer other people spontaneously to have pointed this out. So the story unfolds rather than with me always saying, oh, you know, look in, in chapter 35 uh, and see what the repost re to that is. So... It was um, not so much a choice of cutting people out. I wanted, but I also wanted not to repeat too much because evidently certain groups would be saying the same things. Hmm. So the first time I came across that point of view, uh, I would put it in. But then although the point of view came up in several interviews, I didn't want to repeat it every time. I mean, one of the more interesting things that... Um, came up at the very first meeting was the president of the department said that um, a flock of sheep is not like a, a, a whole load of bricks. They're not the same. A flock of sheep is like a jigsaw. And in a jigsaw, if you have some bits that are missing, it doesn't make sense anymore. Translating that in to a more concrete in terms of sheep, it means that the sheep that are in the mountains have been there the, the last year, the, the mothers, the ewes, and three or four years before, they know where to go. They know where the best pasture is. And if you take away those sheep, those older sheep, by them being killed by bears, then you're losing that knowledge, that communal knowledge, which helps to manage the uh, pasture and also the genetic selection that the farmer has been making for sheep which are best adapted to that pasture, that's lost as well. Mm -hmm. so one thing I want to emphasize is that um, the losses, there are plus sides to having shepherds in the pastures that are not just to do with protecting from bears. They are uh, the fact that the shepherd is there permanently means that the, she the sheep get, uh, which tend to get diseased or sick in somewhere or another, can be treated straight away. Whereas if the shepherd only comes up once a week, which they used to do before bears were there, mm -hmm. uh, those illnesses would develop and the entire flock would lose out. So that is a, another positive side and actually a positive side of having bears there, that there are more shepherds in the mountains than there used to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I picked that. And I, I I picked up on that part that you said about the uh, that the flock of sheep is like a jigsaw, which I thought was very insightful um, because often um, environmentalists or, you know, pro rewilding people, they uh, tend to dismiss the losses as in like, oh, you lost the sheep, you will get paid for that sheep, you know, not big deal. Uh, and they are somehow missing, you know, all the emotional aspect of, of losing an animal that shepherd or, or farmer cares, uh, cares of. But also now you're kind of introduced, at least to me, and I'm sure to many readers of your book, this additional concept that it's not only but not only shepherd but also those those actual sheep they have like roles in the flock there are there are elder and there are this and that and this isn't like a measure it's not like a bag of bricks and you can replace anyone for anything else it's way more complex so i thought it was very good and and, and very insightful and in the book uh, there's a ton of information like that so 
just on the just to finish off on the you know uh, 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 on the subject, like, you know how was how the process of writing the book looked like. You included a ton of fantastic photographs in a book, um, and they're illustrating you know chapters and landscape and what was the process of like are you been taking photos deliberately for the chapter for the book or do you have like a library you know of many many thousands tens of thousands of photos and then you selected photos like I, i'm just curious like how how deliberate was that and you know the whole selection process of the photos for the book well i i do have a big selection of photos because I've been walking uh, for 25 years in the Pyrenees, and I've written already two books about that. Uh, to go back a bit, uh, when I moved to France, I joined a local walking group, discovered some of the long-distance treks, and determined that I was going to do one of the long-distance treks, the GR10, as it's called, from uh, the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. And I was... What I discovered in that during that trek was not just the beauty of the countryside, the challenge of uh, walking day after day, but also I met people. And this is one of the reasons that I ended up writing a book more about people, more about animals than about scenery. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the pictures, I, I, when I was in the Pyrenees, when I was uh, interviewing people, I was always asking them, can I take your picture and so on. And I take a lot of pictures and most of them are a lot of rubbish. Uh, but some of them come out all right. Uh, and particularly, I, the, I think the best photo in that book are not actually mine. I mean, I really love the photo of uh, Griffin vultures. Oh, yes. Which are eyeing up the dead sheep, which uh, I paid for that photo. From uh, There are a couple of um, local naturalists who do a lot of very good photography, and they let me have that for a reasonable price. Oh, perfect, perfect. No, like, uh, uh, the, and, you know, I, I again want to kind of allude to, like, how <laughs> how fantastic that book is, because it's not only text, not only fascinating story, but also beautiful photos and, and uh, illustration. And, and it, this gives a feel, like, uh, you know, about the environment and where, where the whole story is happening. And speaking about that, let's, let's just... Uh, talk about a little bit of the of the landscape. Like, how does it look like? These they, the they, they're called estives. Am I pronounce that? Yeah, right? the summer pastures are called estive. It's related to the word for summer, ete. Um, the Pyrenees go up to three thousand four hundred meters high at the top, which uh, there are still uh, glaciers. Mm. Um, so their size is diminishing. Working your way down, you then come to barren rocks. Uh, by the time you get down to 2,500 meters, you have grass, uh, which interspersing in the rocks. Then you start getting some trees from about 2,200, depending on whether it's the north or the south side of the mountain. By 1,600, uh, it's largely forest. This is very schematic. But um, the summer pastures are located somewhere between 1,500 up to 2,200, more or less. So somewhere between the forest and the rocks, um, the forest is obviously where the, the wild things live. And so the higher up you get, the fewer wild things you, you have that might be a problem for a sheep. But on the other hand, the more difficult the conditions are both for the sheep and for the shepherds. Many of the places in the Pyrenees up at that height, you don't have a phone signal. Oh. Um, Potentially, you could have a satellite phone, but most shepherds don't have. They um, have to look after themselves. 
And the pastures are steep, sometimes very steep. Um, they're not like uh, you imagine the Lake District in um, England, and certainly not like uh, the kind of hills you have in Ireland. They are can be 100% slope. Now, 100% slope is actually 45 degrees. Um, and that's the kind of uh, <coughs> pastures that most of the Pyrenean shepherds have to deal with. They can be, obviously, there are bits that are steeper. The sheep will go, unfortunately, and get themselves stuck on sometimes on the steeper bits. And shepherds don't really occasionally will risk their lives to try and rescue a sheep that is stuck um, somewhere and can't get out. Yeah. So it, it's not an easy uh, life. And the um, shepherds may be three or four hours from the ne- walking from the nearest road. I, was, I had that impression, and I was actually going to ask you how... Uh, obviously, you're a very experienced hiker and walker. It almost felt like sometimes it was challenging to get to these people and do those interviews, and it was like hard work. Yes, it, 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 it's something that I can take in my stride, so to speak. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, one of the things that, again, resonated with me, I liked it a lot in the book, is that I think some one of your guests said that the danger is really ethical, not financial, of the of the whole right? And this is really the main friction point where we talk about rewilding every, anywhere in the world, because a lot of, a lot of anti-rewilding, let's say, people, they, they have this strong argument that, oh, the rewilding is a fundamentally anti-rural, anti-farming movement. Um, and then that is contrasted with arguments that, well, but the farming was and I'm speaking generally because, uh, but that also refers to to the to the Pyrenees, the farming and and sheep sh- shepherds were there before, you know, while the before the animals disappeared. So it's not really, um, you know, anti-rural or or anti-farming. But at the same time, I think that the farming moved on since and and changed. And part of that change are probably are also a, a subsidies, which are like a big, big part of that. So I, I'm just curious of, of, of your 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 comments um, on, on on this, whether it's anti-rural and like how much we moved on from the times that that the wild animals were there and the people were coexisting. That now it might feel like you know someone who doesn't live with consequences of those animals requesting people who do live with the consequences of animals being there kind of to go back to the old ways, which are sometimes not feasible anymore. Well, the old ways in in terms of the Pyrenees, let's go back to the middle of the 19th century, around um, 1850, which was the time of great highest population in the Pyrenees. We're now probably about half that population, I'm talking about the, the higher villages, maybe even not, not that. Um, there was a lot of industry, mining principally, but also iron and so on in the, in the Pyrenees. And coexistence wasn't quite, isn't quite the right word in the sense that um, they, everything was marginal. Uh, the shepherds were living in stone-built huts in the summer. And if with gaps everywhere, it would be a, a beaten earth floor, a kind of igloo-shaped stone structure. The shepherd would have for a bed and to sit on a stone bench. There'd be a fire in the centre if there was wood nearby, but it was needed for making cheese. Needed At that stage, nearly everybody made cheese in the mountains. Uh, and if the wind howled outside, the wind howled inside. Um, this was the kind of poverty which shepherds were subjected to at that stage, and nobody is suggesting that they should be going back to that 
uh, kind of coexistence. At that stage, of course, shepherds would shoot uh, any wild animals that uh, came into contact with their sheep or at least frighten them sufficiently that they stayed away, something they can no longer do. Uh, at that stage, there were no subsidies. Hmm. And now uh, farming in the mountains is subsidized to the extent that most farmers will get about 50% of their income from subsidies or one another because society in general wants to keep farming and villages alive in the remote areas. If we ended up with a situation where that farming disappeared, the en entire countryside would change its aspect. Uh, so, there's all, But there's also the problem is our farmers farming for food production or our farmers farming the countryside for tourists, uh, for keeping villages artificially alive. And that is where the ethical question comes in. Very interesting. How you feel about this? Um, I live in a small village, uh, not in the Pyrenees. I'm about an hour's drive from the nearest bit of the Pyrenees. I'm quite often there. It's not that we are remote. People say these villages are remote. And that's the wrong way of looking at it. If you're living in a village, you are not remote. What is remote is uh, London or Paris, in my case, and so on. Um, the internet has been a great boon for myself. Uh, my wife and I moved here because we had at that time a business uh, doing inter making internet sites. In fact, we were one of the pioneers in the area. Um, but there are still big discrepancies between the services you have in villages and what you have in towns. On the other hand, of course, we have this, uh, uh, what I consider uh, a much more, a much better lifestyle living in the countryside. What do we do? Uh, how much should be done to maintain this lifestyle? Uh, the idea of the countryside as a, is it something that is just there for townspeople to come out and enjoy? Or is it something that should have its own life and its own uh, meaning? Uh, I'm with the people who say that the, the countryside has to have meaning. Yeah. And, you know, even even the point that, that you make uh, just right now, that in this, in this show, that actually bears provide benefits to that you know lifestyle let's say because now shepherds doesn't don't live in a uh, stone huts anymore right they have uh, cabins and those cabins are provided to them um you also mentioned that well there's actually more shepherds now in the hills while they're bare because they need to look after their flock and there are additional benefits is that like why there are people who are you know against sort of against that because you even you said you said in the book there's a number of people who actively refuse to take part in any programs any subsidies they they don't want to guarding dogs anything because that would be acceptance of bears which you know I'm thinking with the absence of that then It, it it probably will be the opposite of what you say. They they would just be you know lost that value in itself. The shepherds who are against bears would say that the huts are not necessarily coming to because of the bears, but because society wants shepherds in the mountains, uh, and if you want shepherds and sheep in the mountains and the living villages then you've got to improve the conditions for shepherds. So, And they also will say that bears are making their life more difficult, which is true. So it's a very difficult position that uh, for shepherds who have to... Uh, they're told that they need to look after their sheep. Hmm. They want to look after their sheep. 
They have, they want to make cheese in the mountains. They have new uh, regulations which for for making cheese, which make their life more difficult. They have to modernize their huts and so on. Um, if society wants mountain cheese, then it's not economic to make it. Evidently, you know, you can make a cheese down on the plain much more cheaply than you can make a cheese in the mountains. Therefore, they would argue that society should be subsidizing this making of cheese. Okay. And it is actually using resources which would not otherwise be used. It's using all that grass. It's not using artificial feed. It's not having the same carbon footprint that uh, feedlots have or uh, animals that are inside barns have. It's using a, a, a natural resource to, pro to provide food both in the form of uh, milk, which is cheese usually, uh, and, uh, and meat. And therefore, there is a good reason for maintaining this. The bears, these anti-bear uh, shepherds will argue, are a constraint. Yeah. Uh, so the government is asking for two different things. Is asking for them to live with a difficulty, uh, but then again, asking them to to uh, well, it's asking them to live with the difficulty. Yeah, yeah, and and continue. But how realistic is it? it? Because that's another argument that is quite often um, raised by rewilding community. Let's call them this way. That oh, tourism can replace that and we can live in the tours we don't need to have that much like how how much reality is that in it that that um because there is a there is a move out of rural areas right there's people less people in in general like new new generation is not going to the to the cities and they're taking you know getting job in technology or whatever so so people are draining from from the countryside so not in the Pyrenees. Not, uh, so yeah. So that's a, so that's what I'm asking. That's a that's a that's a uh, my my question because you, you know what I'm what I'm heading with this. That some people say like, oh, you you can you can live with tour of tourism. You don't need those these farmers. You can just you know rewilding brings the tourist money and so on. And then inevitably there is an argument like, well, all those farmers, shepherds, or whatever they are, they are gonna die down eventually, and then we're gonna rewild everything. Well, that was one of my reasons for going to the Abruzzo in Italy, because there, tourism uh, is a big factor uh, in keeping the villages alive. And in fact, uh, it is probably there's more income from tourism than there is from farming. Uh, the reason that the flagship species is uh, the bear, brown bear in the Abruzzo, uh, wolves in certain parts of it. Now, <clears throat> it's not that many people get to see either bears or wolves. It's not, you know, it's supposedly tourism uh, based on rewilding, but really those are just umbrella species that people never see, but because they hear that they're there, They think, this is wild, this is real nature. It's not. It's managed as, as anything else is, mm -hmm. uh, as much as towns is in many ways. Um, but that's why they go there. On the other hand, let's imagine that wolves are spread across Europe as they are doing naturally themselves. You're not going to have wolf tourism when there are wolves everywhere. You may have certain places which are particularly renowned for it, but certainly not everywhere. Bear tourism, uh, again, that's going to be when bears are, I think they, this is going that way, more widely distributed. There may be certain areas where bears can make a, a landmark, links the same. There's a particular town in Germany which makes it links as its own uh, motto, if you like. And but when these animals are more widespread, all to the good, uh, to the, that kind of tourism will be less significant. I remember when uh, we started having wind farms here, 
when we've got a lot of wind here where I am in the old, um, there were people who were saying, oh, we'll be able to have wind farm tourists and people will come and see these um, the, these giant windmills. Now, luckily, nobody be, thought this was a good idea because <laughs> it would have been a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes you're right it's 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 becoming normalized and then when it's normalized it's not attractive anymore mm-hmm. and uh that's... it doesn't mean to say that the the that nature will stop attracting people if there are more natural areas it will have to be a uh, quality yes yes oh and and you know there's also the, always an uh, argument that even if you talk about uh, nature and and biodiversity and all that like a whole bunch of tourists who all of a sudden showed up there is not exactly great for nature and biodiversity because the the impact of the footfall and the, mm. all the infrastructure that then you need to build for those tourists are probably not that good so then to your point that then shepherds with their flocks on the mountain are having much less i think impact even by the sheer numbers on the environment, plus they're, you know, producing cheese or milk or whatever that is. Mm. So, listen, um, one other question on this part that I have is related to hunting or lack of hunting. And you even mentioned um, that they're not allowed to have guns to to scare. And even if there, 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 there's a part in the book where you talk about... Um, shooting bears with a with a rubber uh, bullets or, or rubber but s- still they need to call some special squad to do that mm-hmm. like to to me it's it just doesn't sound right like would you think that introduction of either limited hunting or introduction of some sort of a depredation tags that will allow uh shepherds you know to deal with the problem animals would help the situation. N- maybe not even necessarily from the perspective of that they will actually, you know, kill the bears or or thin the population because there's not many of those bears there anyway. But like psychologically, you you have the the people then they they feel because I, I think that a lot of pushback is that people are feeling powerless to what's going on, right? The government now first paid us to kill the bears. We kill the bears and now the same government brings the bears and now we can, we, we are helpless. So I often think that although it's a token move quite often, it, it, it could have, you know, powerful effect of the giving these, these people something to, you know, e- e- even that shepherd in the hut that, if they have a gun, even with the rubber bullets, they they can hold on to some action that they can take. While if they doesn't have that, it's like, what do I do? Something there's something to be said for that. And various shepherds uh, have mentioned the feeling of uh, being impotent uh, uh, against uh, the, the, th- the threat. But on the other hand, with only sixty four bears in the Pyrenees. Uh, if you start killing them or even injuring them, then uh, there is no way that you're going to get to a viable population. And indeed, in 2020, three bears were actually killed in the Pyrenees. Illegally. Well, one of them was what might, one might describe as a hunting accident. They were hunting wild boar. Uh, a bear was there and instead of doing what they might have well have done, and I think probably ought to have done, which is stop the hunt and go away, they continued to hunt. And the bear, uh, they came across the bear again, and the bear was like, was attack, uh, approaching one of the hunters, and the hunter fired and killed it. The other two, however, were much more serious cases. In one case, uh, a bear was found shot uh, dead, the other case, uh, a bear, which uh, nobody has been accused of that as present, that was in the Ariège. The other case was in Spain, and that was uh, where a bear was poisoned, and a whole group of people were organising uh, two poisoned bears, 
and that is coming to court probably sometime next year. So that's three out of 64, and those are uh, illegal or semi-legal uh, instances. If we if we were allow to allow some legal uh, damage to bears, then would that stop the illegal ones? I'm not convinced that it would. No, and even what you mentioned, like 64, is that population viable in any way? Are they reproducing uh, these, these bears? They're doing very well in terms of population. There were 16 births um, this year, at least 16. Uh, but uh, about half of those will die for one reason or another this winter. Uh, so, but the population is nevertheless increasing by, I think it's about 10% a year. Oh. Um, the figures for the number of bears you'd need for a viable population, 258 was quoted by the Muse Natural History Museum as being out of danger, but almost, but near, not quite out of danger, almost in the vulnerable category. Of uh, the IUCN, which means that you know, if you want to have a population which will survive uh, independently, you're going to be up at 500, and that's uh, very difficult for shepherds to envisage. Ecologists say it's not the number of bears that counts; it's the amount of protection you do of your sheep. Hmm. Uh, that is the main factor. One of them pointed out that a single bear one year killed uh, 160, whereas um, in other years, uh, the 40 bears had only ki killed that many. Uh, this is before 2016. And therefore, he was suggesting that it's not the number of bears that really counts, or it's a small factor. Uh, on the other hand, there must be some correlation between the number of bears and the number of dead sheep. Hmm. For sure, for sure. Well, it's a. Uh, I guess again, uh, I was I was almost going to say it's a good news that the population is increasing, but then if you're on the shepherd side, that's not the good news. Yeah, and you, you know, you were very honest in a book admitting that you you try to. Um, you know, don't take sides and don't inject your own point of view. But then it's you know it, it, it's impossible to be unbiased. You know, there is there is, and it was funny because just day earlier I was I was listening uh, to the podcast where people were saying exactly the same thing about the how the journalism changed. That there was there was this concept that the journalist doesn't inject their his own or her own point of view to the material, just presents the facts. But then that changed because it's impossible to do really so so now it's okay if a journalist says like oh this is my point of view so what's your point of view like what's your where where, where do you sit well just to preface uh my reply to that i had an email from one of the shepherds yesterday i'd sent out i said to everybody that i interviewed i'd send them a copy of my book when it came out and this he was one of the few that can read English for the rest of my translated their interview. And he said that I was faithful to what he had said. This is a shepherd who uh, lost 209 sheep over a cliff. So you can imagine what his attitude to bears is, although it's more, it's perhaps more reasonable than you might, uh, than you might think. Mm -hmm. um, my viewpoint is that I've, I'm still divided between the cultural uh, view, which is that uh, we as, human, as humans have lived with sheep and they have been part of our civilization for the last uh, 5,000 years, that the mountains uh, are, not are not wild. The mountains have been created by humans and the way they look is being created by humans, at least in the Pyrenees, I'm not saying, and certainly in Britain and Ireland. Um, on the other hand, I think there's a, 
that's the one side of it. The other hand, I think there is more space for nature and there should be more space for nature. And if we are going to uh, survive uh, in a planet that's worth living in, we need to expand that space. It doesn't mean to say necessarily more top predators, which cause problems. There's a whole range of things which can be called rewilding, which are worth doing uh, because not, it's not just a question of the ultimate rewilding, letting nature have its way, but it's a, a question of um, improving soils, uh, planting trees, allowing trees to grow, and uh, a whole raft of measures which can be taken by people at all kinds of of all kinds of different people in all kinds of different scales. That's a, that's about summarizes like what I what I think you know where people are asking what do I think about bringing back wolves to Ireland, you know I, I say like I would love to but I don't see how <laughs> how 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 you how would you make this work. Um, I, I just want to make a quick segue into wolves. Uh, you 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 dedicated, you know, a part of book to wolves and and situation with wolves and and so on. And one of the things that struck me, and uh, I'm I'm interested about this for 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 some time, is that really there's more livestock killed by dogs. By straight and feral dogs than wolves, uh, in in many parts, uh, and and I think this is this is something that that you also um, mentioned in your book. What's your point of view on? And this is like a, a little theory of mine, but I'm, you know, I'm I'm gonna take opportunity to validate that with you and see what what you think. M my point of view is like if rewilding people, people who let's say, advocating to int introduce wolves. If they try to tackle the problem of dog attacks on sheep, they not only would gain some ground and some um, you know, trust of farmers because they're sorting, trying to sort the problem that is affecting them, they would also learn how to then protect livestock from wolves, which wolves are dogs. I think that uh, the problem with that kind of attitude is rewilders from outside coming in to tell shepherds how to manage their business. Um, yes, it's true that dogs are a problem, but re rewilders are not, are not the people to uh, help solve that problem. Hmm. And yes, it would obviously if you can protect your sheep from dogs. But how do you do that? You know, the way the way people in the Pyrenees in France and Europe uh, protect their uh, their sheep, their goats, indeed their horses, and so on uh, from wolves is to have livestock guardian dogs. Hmm. Livestock guardian dogs have a cost. There's a cost. Uh, uh, the cost is very big when you've never used them before. You've got to train them. You've got to bring them up. You've got to bring them up with the sheep, for example. And I've been in um, sheep sheds where the uh, the mother dog is uh, has puppies feeding off uh, her uh, milk, and the the lambs. Are trying to get in there as well. Mm. Um, so this is the kind of intimacy that these livestock guardian dogs are brought up in, and they think that the, the flock is part of their life, and therefore they will protect it. But they have a cost in terms of food. They have a cost in terms of training and, uh, and management, and you need an awful lot of them. Uh, Two, depending on the situation. So you could have livestock guardian dogs in uh, places that, like in islands, that only have 
you no, no longer have top predators to guard against uh, domestic dogs, strays, and so on. And the, the reason that people won't do it is that uh, uh, it costs too much. Yeah, true. And if, they, if there were government subsidies, then yes, it would be done, but there's not going to be that because uh, the situation has been around for so long and it's uh, a question of responsibility for dog owners and that's uh, the way it is seen at present. Yeah, true. It's very true. Um, Steve, uh, to wrap this up, what's your prognosis for the future? How do you think that this bear situation like obviously bear is close to your heart from from all the presence i i'm just wearing like a bear t-shirt for yeah. this recording people don't see it but i i felt like it's only proper attire for today's topic um so how do you think it's gonna play it out uh you know 10 20 years in the future do you think this is gonna be like a slow slow increase of number of bears uh or or like how if you look at the in the crystal ball, crystal balls are very distort the images that you see. There are almost certainly going to be more bears. There's going to be more conflict. I really do not see the the bear wars, so to speak, stopping anytime soon. The latest developments are that the politicians who are now local politicians arranging themselves again against national politicians, local politicians arranging themselves against the anti with the anti bear shepherds against the national consensus, which is that there should be more bears. Uh, the government is constrained by the Habitats Directive. And so we have two blocks which are not really trying to find a solution. I don't think there is a solution. There may be a way forward, uh, like a, a route map, but uh, they're not trying to, they're, they're just butting against each other. And so I'm not particularly optimistic about the way things are going. There's a bit of a difference with wolves in that, Wolves have uh, reintroduced themselves in, uh, without any help, without any help, not quite, because it, with, uh, when hunting became illegal, again, with the Habitats Directive, this is human intervention, uh, which has allowed them to spread and will allow them to spread throughout the country. The problem there might will be that... Um, if you have an occasional wolf attack, there's not very much you can do about it uh, that it is economically viable. If you're in an, an area where there are, there is a pack of wolves, then you can do something about it or move out. I think um, wolves are going to become so ubiquitous that uh, they're going to have, assuming the government doesn't backtrack, uh, or Europe doesn't backtrack, that uh, they will become more accepted despite greater difficulties. Oh, it's you know, and 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 you touch on the on the point that we somehow didn't mention earlier in the show is that probably also the fact that the bears were reintroduced by human hand, brought from you know different part of the world and release is also you know. Uh, huge friction point versus oh they're just came back here to just you know on their own devices which which i see is the biggest obstacle to any sort of rewilding on you know on on, on the islands whether ireland or or uk that wolves showed up in belgium and they showed up in netherlands and like well great we have wolves now i guess while on the island, you need to have a permissions, paperwork, signatures, stamps, and then you need to actually put the wolves into the crate and ship them over and release them. And this is like a huge, again, um, not ecological, but kind of psychological problem. Like, who are these people? 
who are releasing those walls, right? And 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 I think, do you think that the 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 conflict would be less in Pyrenees if those walls just showed, if those bears just showed up on on their own devices one day? Certainly, uh, there are bears in the uh, in northwest Spain, and potentially the rather unlikely because of all the infrastructure that separates them from the Pyrenees, potentially some bears could have arrived from there. Uh, it would have been a very it would be a very long time before that happens. Um, on the other hand, I can't say that the arrival of the wolf in France has been uncontentious. There are about twelve thousand sheep killed every year in the Alps. Mm. And in, in general in France, were though mainly concentrated in the Alps and the Vosges and so on. And the shepherds are up in arms. Yeah, it's never easy. It's a, it's a very difficult subject, but I guess, like you said, you know, I, I, I can't help but think about it in terms of, um, in terms of that this is good, that we have more animals and less. Uh, I, I, I fully appreciate the problems um but at the same time you know we have so many like all the all the nature relate nature related news are bad you know this goes extinct and that goes extinct and this down 70% and this down 80% and so story of wolves and bears and lynx these top predators in europe is probably one of the few sort of positive stories We're like yeah look there's more of them and they're making comeback well my aim is to uh, bring shepherds and ecologists and hunters closer together in the sense that they understand more of the other people's point of view that's what i love you have you on the podcast because this is exactly what i'm trying to do with that podcast bring various various point of point of view and people from different camps um listen to each other so um thank you very much steve for their time uh the book is the implausible rewilding of the pyrenees uh steve steve cracknell uh for people who are watching this on youtube here's a cover of the book uh thank you very much steve thank you